Hello everyone, Tesh uh, Dele. Ben Chikiazzo, Interim Vice President at International Washington. Thank you all for joining today for a special book launch, the English language edition of Pet in Chains, Stories of Nine Tibetan Nuns. The Tibetan version of the book was published in 20 last year in collaboration with the Library of Tibetan Works and Archives in Dharamsala. This book is part of our mission to highlight and raise awareness on the plight of political prisoners in Tibet, which is disturbing rise in recent years. A previous ICT report highlighted in detail 29 cases of torture and mistreatment of political prisoners, including 14 who died as a direct consequence. Just a few days ago, we heard of a 51-year-old prisoner of conscience, Kunjo Jimba, who died in a hospital in Lhasa as a direct result of injuries suffered in prison. Tibetans inside Tibet uh, continue to pay an extremely high price for any expression of Tibetan culture or identity that is not sanctioned by the state. Allusions to Tibetan history, expressions of pride in Tibetan culture, or championing of Tibetan language education can easily be characterized as reactionary or splitist, and therefore criminal in the eyes of Chinese authorities. The punishment of imprisonment does not stop after prisoners are released. Nuns and monks are forbidden to return to their monasteries. Um, released prisoners continue to be closely monitored by authorities, deprived of political rights and all movement, um, completely monitored, including those of their family and uh, actually anyone who they interact with. So this book is part of our ongoing efforts to share the life stories of these Tibetan prisoners of conscience, each of whom has made such huge sacrifice in order to defend their culture and heritage. And this particular book contains the stories of nine young Tibetan nuns. The stories are written by themselves in their own words. Uh, these nuns, these nine nuns, were part of a group of 14 nuns, all prisoners of conscience, in the early 1990s. Um, they were held at the infamous uh, Dabchi prison in Lhasa. And these nuns secretly recorded songs and poems in tribute to Tibet and the Dalai Lama. The recordings of their songs were smuggled out of Tibet and they became an international symbol of Tibetan resistance. Um, we knew them as the Dabchi 14 or the singing nuns. Um, this book provides a glimpse into who they were, uh, why they became nuns, what led them to take peaceful political action, and what happened to them subsequently. Um, it is a story, stories of um, courage, resilience, tragedy, um, but also of torture and pain. Uh, today, for this live stream, we are joined by one of the former nuns who are featured here uh, from Gari Nanari. Um, she was first imprisoned for participating in a peaceful demonstration against Chinese occupation of Tibet in 1992. At that time, she was 13 years old. As a result of three sentence extensions within prison, she, uh, served over, she was sentenced to a total of 23 years. She is the longest serving Tibetan female prisoner of conscience. She remains an irrepressible champion of human rights and nonviolence in spite of everything she has faced in her life. So it is my uh, honor today to introduce you to uh, Ngawang Sangdra. Sangdra La, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. How are you, Sangdra La? I'm good, thank you. How are yeah. you? Uh, we're keeping well. Um, how's your family, your son? He's now 10 years old. Uh, yes, everything's good. And now he's on, in the class <laughs> at home. 
online class. Managing online um, classes is not easy. So anyway, thank <laughs> you so much for joining us today. And I want to express, first of all, our deep gratitude to you for sharing your story as you do have done in the past and so many times. And also for your help in coordinating and uh, gathering um, the stories of eight of your compatriots uh, along with yourself and for the production of this book. So we're really um, grateful to you for that. Huh? Mm -hmm. and, and to begin today's program, I want to first um, ask Sandula, give the floor to Sandula so she can tell us uh, her story uh, today. So Sandula, Thank please. you. <laughs> Thank you for this opportunity today. And uh, <laughs> beginning as I have a very poor English, so I hope I don't confuse all of you. <laughs> mm, okay, I'm a Nawang Sangdu, and as you know that I was arrested and put in prison at the age of 13 in 1990. Uh, so I don't, I didn't have the opportunity to go to school to learn much about the his history of Tibet. But under the Chinese occupation, I knew that we did not have freedom in Tibet. We didn't even have freedom of movement within Tibet, let alone traveling abroad. We didn't have freedom of expression and assembly. We had no get permission. Uh, we had to we had to get permission to travel within Tibet. Therefore, I would to see Tibetans in Tibet live like prisoners. The Chinese government has been destroying all Tibetan way of life. They have destroyed over 6,000 monasteries and many educated monks and nuns are put in prisons. However, because of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, we have monasteries and nunneries and Tibetan education rebuilt in exile in India to keep our unique culture alive. The Chinese government forced every Tibetan family to put the Chinese flag on the roof of their homes. The Chinese government tried to shout the word that the Tibetans love the communist China and that they enjoy religious freedom in Tibet. But the Tibetans who really tried to restore and develop Tibetan unique Buddhist education and culture are super, uh, suppressed and controlled by the Chinese government. So what we see are superficial and showcases to attract tourism in Tibet. I couldn't sit back silently to watch Tibetan culture being destroyed and the Tibetan who tried, uh, tried to promote Tibetan culture being restricted and jailed. Therefore, I had to do something, so I shouted out for a free Tibet, a long live His Holiness the Dalai Lama in the street of Lhasa. I was arrested and sentenced to 23 years. We would have to do the prostration and recite prayers secretly in prison. When you are seen during prostration or reciting prayers, you will be taken aside and beating up. In the winter, they made us stand upside down with our hands in the snow on the ground and beat with a stick on our backs. In the summer, they made us wrapped with thick blankets and run around in Soko in hot sunshine. In 2002, I was released from prison after 11 years in prison on a medical reason. This is because of the support of US government and the international community. I was very ill because of torture in prison. My family invited a monk home to perform some prayers for my recovery. My family did not know the monk, but a family friend recommended as he was a respected priest. He came to our home and performed some ritual prayers. We later found out, found out that he had been arrested and tortured for reciting prayers for my recovery. In Tibet, Tibetans are still facing persecution and restriction for religious activities. If you are employed in government sectors, you are not allowed to practice religion 
and visit monasteries and temples. When the political prisoners are released from prison, they are not allowed to return to their monasteries. For me, I was not even allowed to visit my monastery. I believe Tibetan religion and culture are the head, head of Tibetan identity. Anyone who studied and practiced Tibetan culture in Tibet are controlled and restricted by the Chinese government. People who try to promote Tibetan religion and culture are arrested. You can see our monasteries in Tibet and in India are the source of our Tibetan education. They are like universities for us. They have kept rich Tibetan source of knowledge and education alive over thousands of years. This is universal knowledge and the Chinese government is destroying this in Tibet. The Tibetans are going through tremendous suffering in Tibet under the Chinese rule. I think our only hope to end the Tibetan suffering is to resolve the political issue of, of Tibet through peaceful dialogue. Therefore, I urge you all to support His Holiness initiated middle way approach. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again for sharing that. Um, your undaunted commitment. Always, you know, you make time and make yourself available to advocate and speak for the plight of uh, political prisoners for Tibet for, and um, continue to raise awareness. So I thank you um, for our viewers. Now, Sandra was released from prison in 2002 during a different era of U.S.-China relations when China, as part of a campaign to change the world's image of its rule in Tibet, made an effort to release a few high-profile political prisoners. Um, Sandra La was not due to be released until 2011, so her release was a significant victory for human rights campaigners worldwide at that time. So um, now, Sandra La and her compatriots were uh, imprisoned in the notorious Tabchi prison, or Lhasa's number one prison. Uh, Tepchi Prison is located in Lhasa, uh, Tibet's capital city, and it's one of the main officially recognized prisons in Tibet. With It has, uh, uh, of its different units, it has two special units for political prisoners. Um, unit 3, or Ruka 3, is for particularly for female prisoners, both political and uh, criminal. And Unit 5, or Ruka 5, is for male political prisoners. Um, originally, Tabchi was a military garrison for the Tibetan government before Chinese invasion. And after the 1959 uprising, Chinese authorities converted uh, Tabchi into a prison. Um, in 1959 and early 60s, former prisoners have told us uh, that uh, uh, prisoners were kept cramped shoulder to shoulder at Tabchi, and there were at one point over 6,000 prisoners um, there. Um, hundreds have died here. It is notorious for torture and ill treatment of prisoners. And um, to give context, um, we have a commentary from Steve Marshall. Steve Marshall is someone who spent more than two decades traveling widely in China and Tibet researching human rights situations. Um, Steve is retired now, but he was very happy when we got in touch that we are sharing Sangdral and uh, the Dabji Nan's uh, story again. Um, he served as the Senior Advisor and Prisoner Database Program Director at the Congressional Executive Commission on China from 2002 until 2017 when he retired. So he has written extensively on the situation of political prisoners in Tibet, and among his publications also includes Rugak 9, The Nuns of Tabchi Prison. So I'm going to share uh, Steve's uh, commentary now. I thank ICT for the opportunity to provide a brief summary of the imprisonment, torture, and death of Tibetan women, mostly nuns, in Lhasa's Tibet Autonomous Region, Prison Number 1. Tibetans know it is dropped. Please note that I'm relying on the former Tibetan Information Network publication, Ruka 3, 
the nuns of Dropsy Prison. I visited Lhasa as a backpacker each year from 1986 through 1994 and became familiar with some aspects of the city. When peaceful Tibetan protesters began circling Lhasa's most sacred temple, the Tsuklakong, or Jokong, on the morning of March 5, 1989, monks and nuns wearing lay clothing were among them. I saw armed men atop a police station on the bar car throw glass bottles down at peaceful protesters, and the situation turned violent. Several shops run by non-Tibetans were set on fire, but Tibetans prevented would-be looters from carrying anything away. The TAR government imposed martial law at midnight on March 7. I witnessed the PLA entering the city, and martial law was not listed until May 1990. I returned to Lhasa the next day. A week after martial law was declared, Trungpa, a layperson, became Drapchi Prison's first female political prisoner since 1987. Richard Chunyi of Shuksik Nunnery became the first nun detained in 1989. Nun Punzok of Mechungri Nunnery, with its sweeping view of the Lhasa Valley, became the second imprisoned nun in October 1989. Early in 1990, Unit 3, then known as Old Ruka 3, was established to hold female political prisoners. In mid-1995, 60 female political prisoners were transferred to New Ruka 3. The older block also remained in use. In these facilities, the nuns were forced to engage in months of stressful martial drills and subjected to abusive treatment over the next five years. In April 1996, inmates failed to stand when party members inspected a workshop. People's armed police later beat the nuns, claiming they hadn't folded their blankets correctly. Officials punished some of the nuns, including Noong Sangro, and extended her sentence to 17 years. According to Tim information, the female political prisoner population peaked in 1996 at 164 prisoners. In February 1997, at Tibetan New Year, or Lothar, as three prisoners sang patriotic Chinese songs, Two Tibetan prisoners interrupted loudly with Tibetan songs. Officials beat them and put them into solitary confinement. Seventy Tibetan women responded with a hunger strike. In May 1998, a total of 120 political prisoners remained in Ruka 3. When officials forced the prisoners to stand for Chinese flag raisings on May 1 and 4, the Tibetan women protested. Authorities beat most of them and placed 19 into solitary confinement. Pema Butri, the female head of Ruka 3, beat several women, including Alam Sangro. Officials extended five nun sentences, including Alam Sangro. It was her third extension in total 21 years. In June 1998, the nuns of New Ruka 3 were forced to stand in full sight which any visitor can attest is intense at Lhasa's 12,000 foot elevation. From June 3 to 6, five nuns reportedly died as a result on June 7. Visitors were banned and the nuns were under lockdown for the rest of the year. In August, Pema Butri reportedly ordered confiscation of all Ruka III prisoners' sentencing documents and supervised their destruction in kitchen stoves. During the first half of 1999, Ruka III reportedly was under lockdown and audio-video surveillance. In July, Ruka III inmates numbered 97 and the lockdown ended. By summer 2000, sentence expiry had reduced the total of Ruka III prisoners to 32. I close with words from a poem written by one of 14 nuns who smuggled messages to family and friends in June 1993. Authorities punished each of them in October 1993 with sentence extensions. We, the captured friends in spirit, 
we might be the ones to fetch the jewel. No matter how hard we are beaten, our linked arms cannot be separated. The cloud from the east is not a patch that is sown, and the time will come when the sun from beneath the clouds shall appear. Thank you. We're truly grateful for Steve's uh, relentless, tireless research and data collection to highlight and expose conditions uh, that uh, Tibetan political prisoners face. Uh, for those interested uh, to read more of Steve's research, a few copies of Ruga 3 are available on ICT's online uh, store. And uh, the uh, book is also available for download on our website at davetibet.org. Uh, uh, next, I want to share a excerpt of a video interview with Pinzon Nijun, who is also featured in the book. Uh, this was done by our colleagues at the ICT Europe office. Uh, Pinzon Nijun currently resides in Switzerland. Pinzok was the last of the Top G14 to be released in 2004. She had already served 15 years term out of her 16 years imprisonment sentence and was due for release in 2005. And the early release from prison and her subsequent arrival in United States were linked to pressure from US government and Congress and uh, human rights campaigners around the world. The 34 year old Prince of Newton who survived, uh, who suffered from ill health uh, following torture while in custody was accompanied by U.S. Embassy officials on the flight uh, to San Francisco and was released into ICT's care on arrival here. He had an emotional reunion at the air airport with Ngawan Sandral, uh, who was her former cellmate and who had arrived um, to the United States a few years earlier in 2002. Um, Subsequently, Prince Onyedra emigrated to uh, Switzerland, and um, as you will see in this uh, next video. Chick the uh, just as Sangrala is, Pinzo Nyeje also is a passionate spokesperson for human rights and religious freedom in Tibet, and especially the plight of um, political prisoners. Um, now, as at this point, uh, as part of our uh, book launch, uh, we would like to uh, do some passage readings. And for that, uh, we invited uh, three of ICT's uh, Tibetan Youth Leadership Program graduates um, to read the passages and that um, they read the book and they uh, selected passages uh, that they would read. Uh, first, uh, we have uh, Rinzi Lamo from uh, Philadelphia. Rinzin is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania where she studied neuroscience. He is working as a research technician and hopes to pursue studies in mental health counseling. Rinzin will read a passage from The Reason Why I Escaped by Tinle Chenzong, where Tinle describes the time when 
prison authorities decided to make nuns endure army uh, drilling, army training drills under the hot Tibetan sun. In 1994, the Chinese decided it was time to train us for the army. I found this training more difficult than anything I had experienced in prison so far. I understood that the main purpose of the army training was to punish the prisoners, both physically and mentally. We had a very hard time during that time. The physical exercises were extremely testing also. The final goal was for us to perfect the Chinese military walk, the high step, the straight leg, the swinging arms, and the perfect posture. This apparently required constant military-style drills under the hot Tibetan sun. Sun radiation is extremely strong in Tibet because of its high altitude and the thin atmosphere. Every day, we female political prisoners were forced to spend five and a half hours jogging and marching. We used to have to swing our arms and march in perfect step with one another while yelling such Chinese slogans as become a changed person and protest counter-revolutionaries and preserve the law, preserve the laws. When we were made to stand for another two hours looking straight at the sun with books on our heads, if the book fell, we were beaten. If you moved, we were beaten or kicked. One day, a bit of hair fell over my face. It felt as if it were in my eyes and I wanted to push it back. I did not think the guards were watching very closely at the time, so I moved quite surreptitiously, I thought, to shake it back. The next thing I knew, the back of my knees were being kicked by the guard. We had to stand so straight and tall that all of our muscles were as taut as highly strong wire, and the kick caused immense pain. I almost fell to the Another ground. little drill the military device was to put paper under our arms and between our legs as we stood to attention once again, staring at the sun. If a guard was able to pull the paper out from under your arms or from between your legs, that obviously meant that you were slack. You were not standing rigidly enough. That was a good reason to give you another beating. Quite often, the combination of hot sun and rigid muscles were enough to make you vomit or faint or both. That happened to me once. And when I fell to the floor, I gave the guard another good reason to kick me. The guards treated us worse than animals. They treated us as toys to be used and abused and discarded at their pleasure. I have no idea what satisfaction they got out of all this maltreatment. Tinle was 15 when she became a nun. She had been at the nunnery two years when she decided to join in a peaceful protest in 1992 with some friends. The demonstration only lasted 15 minutes and they were surrounded by Chinese army with guns. Upon her release in 1996, Tinle escaped to India by traveling over the by traveling by foot over the Himalayas from Tibet uh, into India via Nepal. She stayed in India seven years before immigrating to New Zealand, where she currently resides. Um, for the next passage reading, we have Nancy Munki uh, joining us from uh, Chicago. Munki um, double majored in economics and political science at the University of Illinois at Chicago. She is passionate about fair housing and equity and currently working as a real estate broker in Chicago. So Menke will read a passage from Thinking About the Future of a People by Pandey Chodjo. Pandey Chodjo joined um, the nunnery, joined the nunnery after both her parents passed at the age of 14. She was arrested after joining a peaceful protest march in Hassa in 1990. Here she speaks about events uh, that took place at Tapchi prison in 1993. The event that I cannot forget took place in 1993. It became a wound in my mind that can never be healed and that I remember even vividly today. The event took place one or two months before my release. There were five of us from the same sleeping quarters, Gatsun Shizum, Jimmy Yangchen, Nong Chiki, Nong Chizom, and me. When the information and evidence of the recorded songs connected to Tibetan politics fell in the hands of the Red Chinese, my mind became vividly filled with foreboding. However, on the second day, nothing transpired and it appeared to be calm. For 20 days, we were not subjected to interrogation and investigation. The interrogation started on the day when I was scheduled to be released from prison. The day was August 27, 1993. That day, I awoke in the morning, took off my prison uniform, washed myself clean and wore my new Tibetan gown and waited. My cellmates each brought with them notebooks of our shared memory and we waited for the main prison gate to open. The prison gate opened. But from the office of the prison warden, I heard this being said casually. You are not to exit the prison now. 
you are being formally arrested. At the time, I wondered why I was not told about this earlier. I questioned myself about this. The feeling I had then was that this was a great injustice and inhuman thing to do. This was because I had never stepped outside the prison gate and why were they telling me now that I was actually being arrested? My own sadness at being thrown in prison was swept away by my feeling of the sorrow that my relatives might have felt waiting for me outside the main prison gate. On the second day when I awoke, due to sadness and sorrow, tears uncontrollably rolled down my eyes. I tried to console myself, saying that some Tibetans have sacrificed their very lives for the victory of our people. And so why should I be complaining about this? I scolded myself and in this way consoled myself to reduce my sorrow. After a while, I was sentenced to five years in prison. In all, I spent eight years in prison. I was released on August 26, 1998. Pandit Juni released in 1998 after eight years in prison. She tried to escape in 1999, but was re-arrested and imprisoned a second time. She finally escaped in 2010, arriving safely in India. And uh, she continues her Buddhist studies at a nunnery in Dharamsala, India. For the next passage reading, we have Chuni Gyatso from Eugene, Colorado. Uh, since graduating from UC Berkeley in 2017, she worked as a software engineer. She volunteered with Tibet Corp at the Central Tibetan Administration in Dharamsala, and now she's moved back to the United States. So Chuni will read a passage from Torturous Memory of 12 Years in Prison by Gelsen Dyoga. Born in 1970, Gelsen Dyoga comes from a nomadic family and recalls spending most of her childhood herding animals on hills and villages. She joined the nunnery in 1988 for her, for her own wish to study Buddhism. In 1990, she secretly joined a peaceful demonstration and was immediately arrested. In a passage here, she describes why they recorded songs and what happened to them after. In 1993, some of us political prisoners recorded songs and tapes telling suffering of the Tibetan people and political prisoners. We did this to leave to history that despite our dying bodies, our spirit was as high as the Himalayan mountains. Here, I would like to repeat a portion of our songs. O oh, land of snows, land of snows, my beloved country, the soul and heart of our country is Denzin Gyatso, my root teacher, the wish-fulfilling jewel, if the six million Tibetans remain united, there will be a time when the sun will appear from behind the clouds. Unfortunately, the prison warden came to know about our recording of these songs. We were subjected to unspeakable torture. As for me, I was sentenced to an additional eight years in prison, a total of 12 years. My other colleagues also had their prison sentences raised as well. The melodies we sang in prison buried in the mine of history were heard by the merciless rulers who transported us to the land of darkness and sorrow. Our feelings of dark prison conditions when we sang them in melodious songs, the horse of good fortune fell off the cliff, and we were found for 12 years under chains. Genze Joga was imprisoned uh, for 12 years. She, was, she finally escaped to India in 2004, traveling on foot across the Himalayas. From India, she received asylum in Belgium, and today that is where she lives. Um, all the nine women featured in this book today live in three countries, and they are living testaments for the sacrifices that ordinary Tibetans are making for the love of their country. Through their stories, we have a small insight into the role of Tibetan nuns in the struggle, um, China's repression of religion, Tibetan identity, and uh, culture, uh, these nuns are not organized activities, activists. They are real people, each genuinely humble, undemanding, gentle, but at the same time with indomitable spirit, courage, and resolution to make such big sacrifices in order to effect differences in the lives of their fellow Tibetans. 
Both Tibetan monks and nuns have continued to be at the forefront of Tibetan struggle alongside lay Tibetans. Uh, the resilience and spirit of Tibetans living inside Tibet under China's harsh rule are a true inspiration for all of us. Uh, even as the stories that you heard today are from the 90s, um, the situation for political prisoners continues to remain dire. Um, just 10 days ago, ICT urged for an independent uh, investigation into a range of human rights violations in Tibet. Human Rights Watch reported that 51-year-old Tibetan called Kuncho Jimba succumbed to injuries after he was released from custody three months early. Jimba had been detained in 2013 and charged with forwarding state secrets about environmental protests in his home region to foreign media. The court sentenced him to 21 years in prison. He was one of several hundred Tibetans from a place called Diru County who peacefully protested against official orders that every Tibetan house must fly a Chinese flag. Earlier in January, ICT called on the independent investigation again of another young Tibetan monk, uh, Tenzin Nima, who died after being beaten in custody. This was also reported by Human Rights Watch. In May 2020, a monk called Chuki died after torture in custody. Uh, in August 2020, a 36-year-old woman, Lamo, died in custody after beatings. Um, in 2015, Committee Against Torture concluded in a review of China that practice of torture and ill treatment is still deeply entrenched in criminal justice system. And uh, we at ICT, we believe that those responsible in China's Chinese state apparatus must be held accountable for the patterns of torture and mistreatment of Tibetans. And Tibetans need justice, and torture must stop inside Tibet, and the international community uh, can take action to uh, speak up for it. So uh, with that, I want to ask you to join us uh, to take action, and uh, visit savetibet.org, and on the home page, there is a link uh, to take action, and you will see uh, several different actions there, including one for political prisoners. Um, and I hope um, you will make time to do that. And uh, with that, I want to briefly, before we end our program, I want to invite uh, Mama Sandrala back. Um, Sandrala, thank you for joining us today. And I know it's not hard, to, it's not easy to um, share and um, uh, or your story again and again. Uh, but we really do appreciate and um, it helps us uh, uh, educate and um, hear more about the plight of political prisoners, the situation inside Tibet. And thank you. And any final words um, you might like to share, Sandrala? Not much. I would like to say uh, thank you very much, all of you, uh, for supporting Tibet all this time. And please continue to support. And um, your support is very important. <laughs> Don't do that. Oh. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I usually control myself, but today I couldn't control. I'm sorry. It's a, what Kizani Blas says is really true. As we always try to control, I know it's not time to cry, it's time to act. Sorry for that. Yeah. Sorry that. No. Uh, today I really did what we Tibetan has said. And if you look at the cry face, it let you I cry. It's really I did that. Sorry for that. Yeah. I always try to cry. Can't myself, but 
today I wasn't able to sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Santola. I know. I want to say thank you very much, all of you, support for supporting for Tibet all that time, all this time, and uh, it's really your support is very important, very helpful, and your full support it's it make a big impact. Because um, one reason I was sentenced to twenty three years imprisonment. But because of your support, I was released after 11 years for medical treatment. And not only me, and Dana Jing Sambula, and Pindu Nidula, and also Nao Chimbila were released because of your support. Another reason I believe, uh, when I was tired, I asked my father um, if persons small like me really um it could really make a difference and he said right away yes if you work if you act with the, all the strength inside inside of you it would help so i would like to ask you to use your strength inside of you to help work for this in Jirumichi and to all the political prisoners in tibet Ultimately, problem in Tibet can only be solved if the political issue is solved. If the political issue is solved, then everything else can be solved. So I express on behalf of the uh, Tibetans' hopes, uh, their sacrifice of uh, tears and blood, I would like to call on you again uh, to give pressure and Chinese government to uh, have some result oriented support of His Holiness Dalai Lama's middle way approach. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sankola. And I know um, we have ICT members who really care and take action and will stand uh, with you. And we will uh, continue uh, to advocate and work on behalf of Tibetans. So we will continue to do that. So thank you. So much. Um, that brings us to the end of the program today. And uh, I'll just uh, remind everyone, our next episode of Tibet Talks will be on Thursday, March 11th. Um, ICT Interim President Bujun Sirenla will be joined by special guests for a discussion on the Tibetan National Uprising of 1959, a day that we Tibetans commemorate around the world every year. So we hope you can uh, join us then. Our shows are available on podcast. You can learn more at safetibet.org slash pod. Uh, we thank you for your commitment, for your support for Tibet. And uh, we look forward to see you uh, again very soon. Thank you. <laughs>